Hi, I'm Louis Casarella. And I'm Jen Har. We both want to welcome you to how to properly operate and maintain your chainsaw. Your chainsaw is an efficient and productive tool. Operate it properly and safely, along with maintaining your saw, can make your woodcutting experience an enjoyable one. We have a lot of information to cover in this video to help you achieve this, so we'll be going at a brisk pace. But we've chaptered the video so you can easily return to any of the sections if you need to revisit the information. However, it's very important that you view the video in its entirety, as so much of the information throughout the video is intertwined. First, make sure you have the right chainsaw for the task at hand. If you're a professional working with your saw all day, you'll most likely need a larger professional chainsaw similar to this. If you're a homeowner cutting firewood for your home, a mid-range saw like this may be appropriate. Or if you're using your chainsaw for cleaning up around the house or maybe cutting a little firewood at the cabin, then a smaller consumer chainsaw or even a corded or cordless electric chainsaw may be the best. Your steel dealer can help you determine which chainsaw is best for you. Once you've chosen your chainsaw, the very first thing you'll need to do is read the instruction manual and fully understand its contents. Now to get ready for your woodcutting experience, let's go through a checklist of items you're going to need. We'll put these in three categories. Items you'll need to maintain your chainsaw. Other items you may need to help get your job done. And then, protective apparel. To maintain your chainsaw, you're going to need filing tools for your chainsaw. There are several styles to choose from. These will include a round file with a holder or guide, a flat file, and a depth gauge. Also, a handy item to have is a stump vise. Your authorized steel dealer can help you choose these filing tools that best fit your needs. Your chainsaw will come with a scrunch, which is a tool that has sockets on one end. On this side, you can use the socket to loosen the nuts on the sprocket cover, and the other is to remove the spark plug. The end you can use to adjust the chain. A small screwdriver will come in handy. You can use a small brush, such as this old toothbrush for cleaning parts of your saw. Here's some items to help you while using your chainsaw. A gas can along with two cycle engine oil or a container of pre-mixed fuel, such as steel moto mix is a must. Bar and chain oil. Since we'll be felling, limbing, and bucking trees in this video, we're gonna need wedges and a felling ax. And a cant hook or log roller can come in handy. Also on this job, we'll need to remove some limbs before we fell the tree. So we're also going to need a pole pruner like this to safely remove those limbs. As for protective apparel, you're gonna to wanna to have a protective helmet system such as this. Not only will this helmet system give you some protection from falling objects that may be lodged in a tree above you, the face shield will help protect your face and eyes from wood chips and other debris that can be flying around in the air while you're working. And the hearing protection is a must. And always wear protective glasses complying with ANSI for added protection behind the face shield. And here's a caution to remember. If you have long hair like Jen's hair, tuck your hair up under the helmet like this or safely secure it above the shoulder level while working. While working, always wear a sturdy pair of non-slip gloves and it's imperative that you wear protective chaps. Protective chaps can help in reducing the risk of injury to the operator. Let's look at a quick three minute video showing you how chaps can work to help protect you. Personal protective equipment is something that you and your family use every day. Whether it's a helmet when you're riding your bike or motorcycle, gear for your kids when they're playing sports, even the seat belts in your car. And it makes just as much sense and it's just as important to wear personal protective items when you're operating your power tools as well, like your gasoline power chainsaw. In particular, chaps are extremely important because they're designed to quickly stop the moving chain on your gasoline powered chainsaw if it were to accidentally come in contact with your leg. Without chaps, that could be a very serious accident, and at worst, even fatal. As you can see in this example, our MS-271 is cutting a hard piece of wood, and you can see it cuts the wood very quickly. Just imagine how damaging it could be if that were your leg, and the chain on the saw running at full speed accidentally came into contact with your leg. We'll show you how a pair of steel protective chaps with a Vertic Pro fibers can reduce the chances of you becoming seriously injured by a moving chain on your saw if it were to come into contact with your chap. We've wrapped our new pair of chaps on this log. With our MS-271 running at full speed, Louie is going to make contact with our chaps. As you can see, the chain on the saw stopped almost instantly. The Vertic Pro fibers in the chaps, when exposed to the chain cutting through the outer layer, 
have clogged up the cutting system of the chainsaw and stopped the rotating chain. So, how did our lock fare in this demonstration? The chainsaw never broke through the inner layer of the chaps. Now, it's important to understand that no one can guarantee that an injury will not occur or will be less severe because an operator wears chaps. The actual degree of protection afforded will vary with the speed of the chain, the time and angle of contact, power, and torque of the saw, and similar factors. In this case, the operator would have been better off, but they are not intended to substitute good safety procedures. A couple of important points about your chaps. Your instructions that come with your chaps will give you instructions on washing and drying them. Chaps will perform their best when washed prior to their first use. And in the event that your chainsaw comes in contact with your chaps and cuts into the avertic fabric layer, the chaps should be replaced immediately as they have lost their protective effectiveness. But still, as you can see, a new pair is a small price to pay for your safety. So if you use a chainsaw, make sure that you wear your chaps and other personal protective equipment that is recommended in your instruction manual that came with your saw. Thanks for watching. And please, stay safe. As you can see, chaps are very important. And finally, we have our heavy duty steel toed work boots. And don't work alone. Always have a partner with you that can help out, especially if there's an accident or other serious issues where you will need help. Before we begin using our chainsaw, we'll need to go through a pre-inspection process to make sure our saw is ready. First, make sure there are no loose, missing, damaged parts or fasteners. Snug everything up. If anything is missing or broken, immediately take your saw to your authorized servicing dealer to have the chainsaw repaired before you use it. Check the AV system. If any components are missing or if the AV system isn't functioning properly, again, take the saw to your authorized servicing dealer to have the necessary repairs made before using the saw. Check the air filter and make sure it's clean. If not, clean the air filter in accordance to the procedure outlined in the instruction manual that came with your saw or replace it with a new one. Steel has a recommended maintenance schedule in its instruction manuals that will cover all of the items you should be checking and at what frequency. Make sure your chain brake is functioning properly. Never operate a chainsaw equipped with a chain brake if it's not working properly. And make sure the off-on switch, the throttle trigger lockout, and the throttle trigger are working correctly. It's important that you check your saw's spark arrestor if it's carboned up. Clean or replace it, but never operate your chainsaw without the spark arrestor installed. And finally, check that your chain is in good condition, properly sharpened, and tensioned correctly on the bar. To adjust your chain tension, steel has three basic variations, depending on what chainsaw you have. One is adjusting with the front mounted chain adjustment screw, one with the side access adjustment screw, which is the most common on newer chainsaws today. And finally, one with a quick chain adjustment that requires no tools to adjust the chain tension. The technique for achieving the correct chain tension will be the same for all three. It's just the way you access the adjustment mechanism that is different. Always wear gloves when working with the bar and chain as they have sharp edges. Our chainsaw that we're using today has a side access adjustment screw. The first thing you'll need to do is make sure the chain brake is disengaged. Then loosen the bar nuts on the side cover. You should now have slight up and down movement of the bar. Holding the tip of the bar up, rotate the adjustment screw clockwise until the chain is seated against the bottom rail of the bar. Continuing to hold the tip of the bar up, tighten the bar nuts and rotate the chain by hand. If the chain won't rotate freely by hand, you have it adjusted too tight. Pull the chain off the bottom rail. And when released, if it does not snap back against the bottom rail, but is now sagging below the rail, you don't have the chain tight enough. If it's too tight or too loose, start the process over again from the beginning until it is correct. With time, you'll learn to do this fairly quickly. Next, let's go over sharpening chain. If you're watching this on the internet, please refer to the How to Sharpen Your Steel Chainsaw Chain on the Steel USA YouTube channel. A properly sharpened chain will produce large uniform chips like these, and a dull chain will produce fine sawdust like this. When it starts getting like this, you know it's time to stop and sharpen the chain. So here's how it's done. Rotate and inspect your chain and look for the cutter that's in the worst condition. You'll want to start with this tooth. Ultimately, in the end, 
you'll want every tooth on the chain to be sharpened exactly the same and also to be the same length. If you don't, your saw won't cut properly. Make sure the chain is adjusted to be snug on the bottom of the bar rail and place your bar in a vise. If you're sharpening your chain in the field, there are handy stump vices like this that work great at holding your saw steady while sharpening. We'll use this model of the chain's cutter to help explain the sharpening angles that will be important to you. First, this is a filing angle. You'll want your file to be parallel to this angle. If you vary this angle, it will negatively affect the way the chain cuts. The tooth has a marking etched into it that you can follow. When you use the file and guide, you can see that the guide also has an angle to follow. When this angle is parallel to the guide bar, then your file will be at the correct filing angle. From the side of the cutter, you can see the side plate angle. This shows you how the cutter should look from this perspective when it's filed correctly. When holding the file, or in this case the file and guide, you want to make sure that the file is held at a 90 degree angle to the bar and apply slight pressure back into the tooth. Tilting it up or down will negatively affect the way the chain cuts. An important component to this part of the sharpening process is having the correct size file. Too large of a file will cause a back slope, and too small of a file will cause a hook in the chain. Both have very negative consequences, so be absolutely sure you have the correct size file that matches up with your chain. When you use the file and guide, it shows you the proper filing angle as we mentioned before. And the plates on either side of the file rest on the chain components and give you the proper depth for the file and the cutter. To begin sharpening your chain, always file from the inside of the tooth out. Cutters alternate from right hand cutters to left hand cutters. So, in this example, we'll begin by filing only the right hand cutters first. When we're done with those, we'll move over to the other side of the bar and file the left hand cutters. Set the chain brake to hold the chain in position. And file your first tooth from the inside of the cutter out, applying slight pressure back into the tooth with a smooth stroke. If your file is in good condition, you won't have to exert much pressure at all. Only file in one direction, then lift the file out of the cut to pull back. Letting the file drag on the cutting edge on the back stroke will dull the tooth. In most cases, your chain will require the same amount of filing strokes on each cutter. So count your strokes as you file your first tooth. Release the chain brake and move the chain with your gloved hand to the next cutter. Set the chain brake again and file the cutters with the same amount of strokes. Then, measure the two teeth to make sure they are close to identical in length and adjust if necessary. Once you are done with one side of the cutters, move to the other side of the chain and file the remaining cutters. Now, we're not done yet. Next we need to make sure the depth gauge is set correctly and this is real important. The depth gauge in relation to the cutters acts much like a hand plane. The amount of gap between the top plate and the depth gauge and the leading edge of the top plate determines the amount of chip that will be taken out in the cut. Because the cutter slopes down, as it's sharpened and becomes shorter, the chain's depth gauge clearance becomes shallower and needs adjustment. If the clearance is too shallow, the tooth will not be able to cut. And if the clearance is too deep, this can put too much strain on the chain and the components of the chainsaw. These chains are designed to work optimally, with specific clearance that controls the bite. By using your depth gauge and setting it on the chain, as we are here, you see where the depth gauge is protruding above the plate. If you file your depth gauge down to the level even with this plate, you will have the exact depth that you want for your chain. You'll need to do this on each tooth. Then, taper the edge of the depth gauge following the angle that is etched into the tooth. One last item before we use our chainsaw. We need to add fuel as well as bar and chain oil to the reservoirs. Your chainsaw is a two-cycle engine and requires fuel mixed with the proper two-cycle oil. Your instruction manual will give you specific information on what grade of fuel you should use as well as the recommended oil you should add to the fuel. Always fuel your chainsaw outdoors in a well-ventilated area, at least 10 feet from where you will be starting and operating your chainsaw. When you remove the cap, do so slowly to release any pressure that may have built up in the tank. Fill the tank to a level slightly below the base of the opening. Don't overfill it. Take care not to get fuel on your clothing. 
If this happens, change your clothing immediately before operating your chainsaw. Once done, replace the cap and wipe off any excess fuel that may have spilled while you are filling. Then, you'll need to add the bar and chain oil to the oiler reservoir. Again, don't overfill it. This needs to be done each time you fill the unit with fuel. Wipe off any excess oil that may have spilled, and you're ready to go. Before you start work, evaluate yourself. Never operate your chainsaw if you're not in good physical condition, fatigued, or under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or other substances or illness which might impair vision, dexterity, or judgment. If you get tired, take a break and drink lots of fluids to stay hydrated. We've got all of our items from our needs list. Our equipment's all checked out and ready to use, so let's get started. Let's go. We're going to fell two trees today because we want to demonstrate two different felling techniques. First, the conventional cut, and second, the open face cut. Then, we'll go through the process of limbing and bucking up the tree. Here's our first tree, this large pine. The first thing you want to do whenever falling, limbing, or bucking a tree is to analyze the situation and plan your work to get the job done safely and efficiently. Always remember, plan your work and work your plan. First rule of thumb, don't do this work at night or when visibility is limited or if the weather is bad. Only use your chainsaw in daylight hours. Next, if you're going to be felling a tree and it's a windy day, you may want to hold off on that work, waiting for calmer conditions or call in a trained professional to do the work. Wind can drastically affect the direction in which a tree can fall, creating extremely unsafe or even deadly working conditions. Now, when you're planning your work, make sure there are no structures or other property in the vicinity that could possibly become harmed while you're working or felling trees. And never work on a tree standing or lying on the ground that is remotely close to a power line in any direction. And never assume that power lines are not hot. If there are power lines within the area, Stop and call in the proper authority for advice or a trained professional to complete the work. In our case, we know there's no property or power lines that we need to be concerned with. Now the next thing we want to do is check out the condition of the tree and the immediate area surrounding the tree, and then figure out what direction we want the tree to fall. If you have a tree where you notice a lot of rot, like this, it's very possible that it's rotted or even hollow in its core, and unless you're a trained professional with the proper equipment, you shouldn't attempt to fall this tree. It could break or snap while you're cutting, creating what could be very fatal conditions. Check the diameter of the tree and make sure you have a chainsaw fitted with an approved bar and chain that is sufficient enough in length to cut the tree safely. Take a good look at the canopy of the tree and look for dead or loose limbs that could fall while you're working. Back in the day, these were referred to as widow makers. When cutting a tree, the process sets up harmonics or vibrations in the tree that can be just enough to dislodge these limbs. Many a cutter has become seriously and even fatally injured by those falling limbs, thus the term widow makers. When we're determining the direction that we want the tree to fall, there are two factors that we must consider. First, the natural lean of the tree, and second, if the tree appears to be weighted more on one side than the other with more or larger limbs. Both can have a dramatic effect on which way the tree is going to fall, and that may not be in the same direction as you want it to fall. If the tree has a noticeable lean such as this, and you don't want the tree to fall in the direction of the lean, you should probably call in that trained professional to take the tree down. If the tree is fairly straight but has more limbs on one side than the others, that weight on this side of the tree can result in the same conditions as our tree that was leaning. The extra weight will make the tree want to fall in that direction. This pine is standing nice and straight with evenly weighted limbs. So we're going to want to fell this tree in this direction in a spot between these two trees further out. Lou is going to place the stake in the area that we want this tree to land. We've determined that this tree is nice and solid and we've looked up at the canopy, didn't see any snags or branches, and we know exactly where we want the tree to fall. But before we begin our felling process, we want to clean up around the area and then create a safe exit strategy for ourselves once the tree begins to fall. Once your tree begins to fall, you'll want to plan two exit paths located opposite the planned direction of the fall, about a 45 degree angle, as shown in this diagram. Make sure these paths are clear of any obstacles. 
Once the tree begins to fall, you'll exit on one of these paths opposite the tree, keeping a sense of what is happening to the tree as you are retreating. Never stand behind the tree when it is falling. It could possibly snap and the trunk may shoot rearward with a tremendous amount of pressure. All right, Louie, now we're ready. Let's go get this tree down. Okay, Jen, but before we fell our tree, we can see some lower limbs that may cause some harm to surrounding trees as ours fall. So first, we're gonna remove these limbs. Never work on a ladder or any other insecure support. Never cut anything beyond your reach with your chainsaw. And never use your chainsaw above shoulder height. To do this job safely, we're gonna use a specially designed pole printer to remove these limbs. When using one of these printers, make sure you have read the instruction manual thoroughly to fully understand the proper and safe way to operate it. We're going to start work on a tree. So first, let me show you a brief video that we made on the Steel YouTube channel on how to properly start your saw. Two things you never want to do, drop start the chainsaw as Casey's demonstrating here, or throw starting it. Operators can get really hurt using these techniques because they literally have no control over the saw once it starts. Okay, Louie, let's show them the two ways Steel recommends. First, your positioning for starting the chainsaw on the ground. Casey has a saw sitting on the ground in a clear, flat area. The bar and chain are clear of the ground and there are no objects or obstructions nearby that could come in contact with the bar and chain. He'll slip the toe of his right foot into the opening of the rear handle. His left hand is pressing down on the front handle, his thumb and fingers fully wrapped around the handle and his elbow is locked. His right hand will grip the starter handle for pulling on the rope. So this is an excellent and safe way to start your saw when you're in a clear and open area. But in case you're not in a clear open area, you got twigs, brush, or debris, Steel recommends a second method for starting your chainsaw in a standing position. First, Casey's going to make sure he has secure footing. He'll position the rear handle of the saw between his legs, just above the knees. He's got a grip on the front handle with his left hand. Thumb and fingers wrapped fully around the handle and his left arm is in a locked position. He'll use his right hand to start the saw. These are the only two methods that Steel recommends for starting a chainsaw. Give it a little practice, it's not that hard and you'll be safer doing so. So we've covered the two recommended starting positions for your chainsaw. Now let's talk about the controls. The first thing you want to do is engage a chain brake. You won't release the brake until the engine starts. If your chainsaw has a purge pump feature, pump the bulb a minimum of five times. Don't worry, this won't flood the engine. All you're doing is moving the fuel from the tank to the carburetor and circulating it back to the tank again. If your saw has a decompression valve, usually found on professional saws, press it in. Next, for cold starts, grip the rear handle with your right hand. Depress the throttle trigger interlock and squeeze the throttle trigger. This allows you to move the master control lever to the cold start position. If the saw was just recently run, you may want to put the master control lever into the warm start position. Holding the chainsaw in the correct position, as we just discussed a moment ago, grasp the starter handle and pull until you feel slight resistance. At this point, give the rope a sharp, brisk pull and then guide the rope back slowly into the starter housing. Two things not to do. Don't ever wrap the rope around your hand for starting. And never let the rope snap back to the starter assembly. This will damage the internal parts. Repeat the process of pulling the starter rope until you hear the saw burp or try and start. Now this is important. If you have the master control lever in the cold start position, move to the warm start position now. Don't pull the starter rope one more time until you do this. If you don't and continue to try and start the saw in the cold start position after that initial burp, the very next pull most likely will flood the engine. So you've experienced the burp and you've moved the master control lever to the warm start position. If you have a decompression valve, you need to depress it again. Now you can pull on the starter rope again. Probably only a few times will be needed to start the engine. And this is important. You don't want to accelerate the chainsaw with the chain brake engaged. Release the chain brake and accelerate the chainsaw a few times to warm up the engine. Engage the chain brake and move into your cutting position. Now you're ready to go to work. 
We brought in our friend Mike, a professional trainer, to fell our trees and to show us the two felling techniques mentioned earlier. Thank welcome, you. Mike. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Before Mike starts, we need to bring up one caution. Neither your partner nor any other person should be within a distance of two and a half times the length of the tree you're felling. Always have them keep a safe distance until the tree has settled to the ground. First, Mike's going to show us the conventional technique. Mike's first cut will be a top cut, sawing down at approximately a 45 degree angle to a depth of one fifth to one quarter of the trunk diameter. He will be using his gunning sight shown here, which is at a 45 degree angle to the plane of the bar. Using the sight and aiming at the precise area you want the tree to fall will ultimately give you a hinge perpendicular to your mark that will allow the tree to fall in that direction. After he has carefully made the cut, he will begin to make his bottom cut. This cut is horizontal to the trunk and should meet the upper cut, creating a wedge of wood that you can remove. Next, Mike's going to move to the back side of the tree and make his felling cut. This will be another horizontal cut, approximately one to two inches higher than the point where the two wedge cuts meet. When he finishes with this cut, He'll want to leave a hinge that is a thickness no less than one-tenth the diameter of the tree. Never cut through this hinge or the tree can fall uncontrollably, creating a very dangerous or even fatal situation. To help assure the tree will not settle back in this final cut, and to help begin the process of falling if needed, Mike is going to use some plastic wedges to help things along. Plastic wedges should always be used, not metal. If your chain comes in contact with the plastic, it probably won't dull the chain. Metal definitely will. When he has finished his cut, leaving the hinge with a thickness of approximately one-tenth of the diameter of the trunk, the tree should be falling or on the cusp of falling. If it remains standing at this point, remove your saw, engage the chain brake, turn the saw off, and begin to drive your wedges into the back of the cut with your felling axe, alternating back and forth and waiting a few moments between hits. It should not take long for the tree to begin falling. The tree has begun to fall. Mike will begin to move away from the tree in one of the two pre-planned exits, always being cognizant of the tree's downward motion. As you can see, Mike's accuracy is pretty good. Using the gunning sight on your chainsaw can help you fell a tree in a desired location as well. So, now we're ready to plan the limbing of the tree and eventually bucking it up into firewood length. But before we do, and while we still have Mike here, we're going to drop our second tree so he can show us the other technique, the open face cut. Again, after evaluating the situation, determining where we want to drop the tree and clearing our exit paths, Mike is ready to start. With the open face technique, we will begin with the upper cut, cutting downward at approximately a 50 degree angle to a depth of one fifth to a quarter of the trunk diameter. While doing this, Mike will once again use his gunning sight as before to aim the fall of the tree into the desired area. Once done, the second cut will be from the bottom at approximately a 40 degree angle, meeting the bottom of the top cut exactly. This will create a 90 degree wedge to be removed. Moving to the back, you will make the felling cut exactly the same way as you did on the conventional technique, making a horizontal cut one to two inches above the apex of the open face notch, utilizing wedges to help control the fall, and cutting in leaving no less than one-tenth of the diameter of the tree uncut, creating your hinge. Once the tree begins to fall, engage the chain brake, turn off the engine, and move away from the tree in one of your two pre-planned exit paths. So we got our trees on the ground, now it's time to begin limbing. First we'll talk about how we need to plan our work. We're also going to talk about some of the do's and don'ts when using your chainsaw, as well as some of the hazards that you need to be on the lookout for. As we begin to work with this tree, we're going to be removing some limbs and then eventually bucking the tree up into firewood. Every time we remove a piece of the tree, whether it's a limb or a piece of the trunk, the weight of the tree will change and you can usually count on some movement of the tree. You will need to carefully plan on how and when you will remove the limbs and where you will position yourself when you do so in order to be in a safe position as a tree moves or shifts. When we're cutting our tree, there are some hazards that we need to look out for. First, reactive forces. 
There are three types of reactive forces, pushback, pull in, and kickback. Pushback can occur when you are cutting wood with the top of the bar and it becomes pinched in the cut. The reaction of this can cause the saw to drive backwards very rapidly towards the operator and may cause loss of control. Pulling can occur when you're cutting wood and the bar and the chain become pinched in the cut. The reaction of this can cause the saw to pull forward and may cause the operator to lose control. Kickback can occur when the moving saw chain near the upper quadrant of the bar nose contacts a solid object or is pinched as shown in this diagram. Always use caution and be aware of where the tip of the bar is at all times. Spring poles can present a very dangerous situation. Cutting this can cause the sapling or limb to spring backwards towards the operator and cause loss of control of the saw and severe or fatal injury to the operator. One way to cut these is to make a series of shallow cuts at the apex of the tension as we are doing here. These shallow cuts will gradually relieve the tension of the wood and eventually allow you to cut the wood, reducing the chances that it will spring backwards. When you're moving around a work area, always carry your chainsaw with the bar pointed rearward and the chain brake engaged. Even between cuts, when you have to reposition yourself, you should engage the chain brake. Never let your partner or other workers in the area get close to your work. They need to stay at a safe distance. Develop a set of hand signals that you can utilize to communicate briefly with these people. And never allow anyone to support the wood that you're working on. This could cause the chainsaw to pinch in the cut and result in a kickback that you or your partner could become hurt. Always have them wait until you are done working in the area before entering. And when you're using the chainsaw, always stand to the left side of the saw in a way that your body is clear of the cutting attachment. Whenever you are using your chainsaw, make sure you have a firm grip on the machine. You should always hold the forward handle with your left hand, thumbs and fingers fully wrapped around the handle, and hold the rear handle with your right hand, again fully wrapping your fingers around the handle. Hold the saw in this manner regardless if you are right-handed or left-handed. A few other items you'll need to know when working on your tree. Engage the spikes on the front of your chainsaw with the wood you are cutting whenever possible. This can help you better control the saw in the cut and can also help in avoiding the reactive force pull in. And always begin your cuts with the chainsaw at wide open throttle before entering the wood and throughout the cut. When bucking the tree, be careful that the wood does not collapse on your cut and pinch the bar. If this happens, turn off your chainsaw and find a way to remove it from the pinched cut. One way to avoid this is to use your wedges to hold the cut open, allowing you to finish your cut through the wood. A technique you can use when cutting limbs is to first make a bottom cut partially through the limb, then make a top cut to release the limb. If the limb is under pressure and wants to move upwards, do just the opposite and start your cut from the top, cutting partially through the wood, and then finish the cut from the bottom. When you're bucking up wood that is lying on the ground, you want to take care never to let your chain come into contact with the ground. A rotating chain can become dull if it comes into contact with the ground for only an instant. In this case, we will cut our log into the desired lengths by making a series of cuts, but never completely cutting through the wood to avoid having the chain come into contact with the ground. Then, roll the log over 180 degrees and cut down, meeting your previous cuts to release the log. We'll start our work from the base of the tree, removing limbs but not the ones supporting the tree on the bottom. After we cut these limbs, we'll engage the chain brake and remove the limbs to keep the immediate area clear to work in. Once we have reached the top of the tree and removed the limbs, we will begin our bucking cuts moving towards the base of the tree. When we reach a limb we have left that is supporting the tree, we need to begin carefully removing these limbs. Plan this work carefully. They will be under a lot of pressure and you can see that we are beginning our cuts a little further out to see how the tree is going to react. Continue removing the limbs according to your plan until the tree safely comes to rest on the ground. Then we will continue bucking the tree to complete the job. Our chainsaw work is done, but before we can say we're completely finished, we need to do a couple of maintenance items on our chainsaw. After the chainsaw has plenty of time to cool down, the first thing we're going to want to do is take a quick look at the unit to make sure there is nothing broken or missing. Then we're going to clean the saw up. 
Remove the bar and chain. This area of the chainsaw gets extremely dirty and it's important that you clean it up after every use. Both power head and side cover that you've just removed. With our toothbrush and rag, we can remove most of the debris that has built up. The bar and chain oil that's lubricating the chain will tend to make an oily, greasy texture. We'll clean our saw over an old piece of newspaper or disposable material and then dispose of it properly. When you're cleaning this area, note the oiler's passageway. Make certain this area is clean and free of any debris or obstacles. You will also be able to see the chainsaw's adjustment pin mechanism. Make sure this area is also well cleaned. Take the bar and wipe it down. Make sure you have gloves on as the bar rails can become sharp over time. Use your bar groove cleaner to remove impacted debris on the inside of the bar rails. Once you've done this, make sure that the various holes and slots are cleaned. These two holes are where the adjustment pin fits in when you reassemble the saw. There's one at the top and one at the bottom. That's so you can turn the bar over and maximize the wearability of the bar by using both sides. Every time you sharpen the chain and each time you remove the chain, you should reverse the bar. These two holes are where the automatic oiler will deliver a stream of oil that is picked up by the chain to lubricate critical points of the chain as well as the bar. If these are clogged up, you will probably get insufficient oil to the bar and chain. All of these holes need to be perfectly clean. This is also a good time to once again check your air filter. Clean it according to the instructions in the manual or replace it if necessary. Also, inspect your starter rope for any wear. Replace the bar and chain and tighten it as we discussed earlier. We've cleaned up our chainsaw, checked it over, and sharpened the chain. We can now put it away. If you're going to be storing your chainsaw for a period of time, you'll want to loosen the chain before you store it and remove the fuel. Steel has a video on their YouTube channel named How to Store Your Gas Powered Equipment that goes into much more detail. And again, if you're watching this on the How to Properly Operate and Maintain Your Chainsaw DVD, we have included this how-to video as a bonus chapter. I'm Louis Casarella. And I'm Jen Har. We'll, we'll see, see you, you next time. time.